and recreate the expansion or contraction history of the universe. And when they did that, they found that the universe is accelerating, like the size of the universe is accelerating. It's getting bigger and it's getting bigger faster every day. So dark energy, what what we what, what's the deal there? So we've got our five percent baryonic matter, which we kind of have a decent handle on. We've got twenty seven percent of the universe, which is this dark matter, which we're not really sure what the hell it is. And then we've still got sixty eight percent, so about two thirds, which is this dark energy. So why why is that important? Why do we why do we care? Um so we care because it's there. That's the most abundant stuff in the universe is dark energy. Uh, it's new. So I remember when the discovery of dark energy was announced and I thought that I was like, oh, these people are full of crap. Doesn't everybody know that there's no such thing as uh, the cosmological constant? Because that's what it was. I was going to say, because it, it has a little bit of a history. I think didn't Einstein describe it as his biggest mistake, which is quite right. He, he did. And so I, I was I could probably walk to within 10 meters of where I was sitting at the time when I heard the announcement because I was in my car. Uh, getting ready for my physics class. And I, they made the announcement. And I was like, oh, these people, they don't know what they're talking about. We already know, everybody knows that there's no such thing as the cosmological constant. Because it, when it was discovered, they called it the cosmological constant because that was the thing. The, the phrase dark energy came out later. So, so um, maybe for the people, why, why did they suggest that this dark energy, this cosmological constant, when I can speak, existed? Why? What was the finding that... So the, what they discovered with the, these two supernova teams, they were looking at distant supernova where they can use the properties of the explosions to determine the distance to those objects. Uh, and then once you get the distance to those objects, then you can basically say, you, you can get a handle on how the universe has expanded in the past. Uh, the main thing is, uh, so uh, briefly on the discovery method, if you have a light bulb, the intensity of the light from that light bulb falls off as the square of the distance. Uh, and that's basically because energy has to be conserved. So if it's expanding in a spherically symmetric way, then the surface area of a sphere goes as R squared. And so the intensity is the energy per, it's like the intensity is the power per square meter. And so if the square meters are getting bigger, then the power is falling off as yep. one over the area. Makes sense, yeah. Um, which is interesting, uh, just a quick thing. Uh, this is the reason why tsunamis are so much more dangerous than they're more dangerous than they ought to be because tsunamis don't expand in three dimensions. They only expand in two dimensions. Hmm. And so the energy in the tsunami falls off as one over R yeah. instead of one over R squared. And so they, the energy in the tsunami, because it's traveling on a two-dimensional surface, propagates for a much larger distance than, than a sound wave or something like that that expands in all three directions. So anyway, so the intensity of, uh, of light from a candle or from a light bulb will spread out, or the power will spread out, which means the intensity will fall as you get farther and farther away. Uh, if the universe is changing size, like going through weird kind of oscillations or something like that, then what will happen is light at a certain distance will have spread out and then it will have come back together again and then maybe spread out again and then maybe come back together again. So you have some weird expansion history of the universe, then light at different distances will have gone through different stages of expansion and contraction which means that the brightness that you observe or the intensity that you observe uh, for these different objects will change based upon how far away they are uh, in a way that isn't just the way a candle or like a light bulb works on yeah. the earth. So they were doing that. They were saying, we have the ability to standardize the total amount of energy coming off of these explosions at different distances. And so we can measure their brightness as a function of time or as a function of distance and recreate the expansion or contraction history of the universe. And when they did that, they found that the universe is accelerating, like the size of the universe is accelerating. Mm. It's getting bigger and it's getting bigger faster every mm. day. Uh, and that was an important discovery because at the time, one of the major uh, conundrums in astronomy was the fact that the universe was younger than the stars that it contained. The oldest stars in the galaxy were like 12 billion years, uh, stars in globular clusters and things like that uh, were 12 billion years old. And the universe itself, if you just look at 
um, the Hubble constant today, and which is the current expansion of the universe, and everything that had been known up to that point, you only got a universe that was like 10 billion years old. And so the stars were 2 billion years older than the universe that they were mm. presumably spawned from. And so the uh, change in, um, so this change that the universe is accelerating, if the universe is accelerating, it means that it was going slower in the yeah. past. And because it's going slower in the past, it means that it takes longer to get to a given size and therefore the universe is older. It's just like um, when you drive, when I drive places, even though the distance that I drive in my neighborhood is significantly smaller than the distance that I drive on the freeway, yeah. the amount of time that I spend getting out of my neighborhood is comparable to the amount of time that I spend driving on the freeway because yeah. I'm moving slower. Yeah. And so the same thing applies here, that the universe in the past was move, was expanding more slowly, um, and therefore it takes longer to get to the stage where it is today. Initially, before that acceleration was, was found, or even after that acceleration, that... People expected that the gravity of those galaxies would pull together and slow down the expansion of the universe, maybe make it crunch back together. And uh, when you discover that it's actually accelerating, that suggests that there's there's something that's going against gravity, that's something that's going in the opposite direction. Which Right, there's which some energy the that's pushing things apart. Mm. Um, it's an energy with a negative pressure, so... Mm. Which is um, then this dark energy. Right, that then pushes things apart instead of pulling it together. So what is the best theory at the moment about what this dark energy is? So so you talked about this this vacuum pressure or this negative pressure. So what what are we talking about there? Um so we don't know we don't know what it is. Uh there are a variety of options. Um there are there are no good options. That's part of the problem. The issue that you face with dark energy is that if you want it, the simplest thing you can do is to make a scalar field. So you say, oh, there's a scalar field and that's the dark energy. Congratulations. This is, this is why it's attractive with the, with the Higgs, right? With the right. Higgs field. And so the, with the same thing with the Higgs, it's a scalar field. So that's, the Higgs is the first scalar field that was ever discovered. Um, the, but dark matter is also a scalar field. Well, it's most commonly viewed as a scalar field, at least WIMP dark matter is. It's like, oh, you have a scalar field, and then because it's the simplest change you can make to the standard model, um, without, and so it takes it wanting to interact with everything that comes that comes along. Right. Yeah. So it's the least amount of work with the most amount of reward. Yeah. Like I have a dark yeah. matter model, and yeah. and there you go. Yeah. Um, so scalar fields are invoked all the time. If you want the scalar field to be to affect things at the scale of the gravitational force then it turns out that it couples very strong, it couples to the same way that gravitational forces couple uh, in that, um, or a couple, for the, for the case of dark energy and dark matter, you need a gravitational strength coupling to the scalar field in order to reproduce the results that you see. And so the gravitational experiments, the torsion pendulum experiments, <coughs> um, you can, uh, they, if there is a scalar field, it should show up in these experiments. So if you take the the dark energy density um, that was measured from these supernova experiments, it gives you the mass that you would need for a scalar field to be the dark energy. So if dark energy is a scalar field, then its mass would be some size. And then because the mass is some size, the force that you get from that interacts over a distance that's the exponential decay of that size, right? It's the um, the more massive the particle is, the shorter the force, the shorter like the range of the force, Yukawa, and the less massive Yukawa the particle. length, or whatever they call yeah, it. Yeah, so it's a Yukawa potential. And so, um, with the dark, with the discovery of dark energy, there's an energy scale associated with it that's in the milli eV scale, and the milli eV scale corresponds to millimeters when you're talking about the length scale over which it would interact. So you have like a Yukawa potential and it would interact over a length scale of a few millimeters. And so there was uh, very quickly after the discovery of dark energy, there was an experiment called the Etwash experiment. Well, it's the Etwash group and they do a bunch of laboratory tests of gravity uh, at the University of Washington. The idea was that they had these two disks and they would cut holes in the disk and um, so there's a, an upper disk that it can swing um, that's suspended by a torsion fiber or by a fiber and then it can twist 
Uh, and then the lower disc is actually two discs, so there's a, a total of three discs. The lower disc is two discs with different thicknesses, and they drilled holes in it, and then they would offset the two discs from each other uh, so that when the pendulum would twist, th then what they would do is they would rotate the bottom ones, and the holes in the upper disc, like in the torsion pendulum disc, as the turntable went underneath it, it would get attracted to the to the place where there was material relative to where the holes were located. So the holes were kind of like negative mass, um, yeah. but they would be attracted towards the gaps between the holes. And so that would start the pendulum swinging back and forth as the mass rotated underneath it. The holes in the lower disc were specifically chosen so that so that the upper disc and lower disc, the, two, the holes that were drilled were offset from each other, and the thicknesses of the disc were chosen specifically so that the two effects would cancel. So that the holes in the upper disc would be evenly matched by um, the extra mass because of the extra thickness of the lower disc, mm -hmm. given the fact that it's farther away and therefore gravity falls off um, at a diff you know, falls off as one over r squared, or the potential falls off as one over r. So it was designed to cancel out the effects of these holes in the upper disc from the turntable. So then the idea is, if there's a new force that couples over a given length scale then it doesn't cancel. The top layer would um, would interact with that force, but the bottom layer is too far away, and so it doesn't contribute that force. Mm -hmm. So if there's an extra force, then it would show up because of the interaction with of the torsion pendulum with the top layer that's not canceled by the bottom layer. Um, and so they were able to probe down to millimeter scales, and then they've gone uh, since that time about a factor of 10 further. Uh, and they demonstrated that there's no new force that couples at gravitational strength down at the mm -hmm scale of dark energy. And so yeah. that presents a major problem because it tells you that the dark energy is not a scalar field. It's not a generic scalar field. So if you want the dark energy to be a scalar field, which many theorists, well, I mean, that, that's what you have to work with when you're a theorist, um, then you have to come up with a way of hiding the, the force or screening it so that it doesn't interact in laboratory environments, but it does interact in cosmological environments. So it's so it's almost like gravity. Uh, I've heard it described in in this way sometimes that gravity potentially becomes repulsive at very large distances, or there's right. an, or there's another term in gravity that we don't understand on mm -hmm. those very large distances, and maybe Einstein didn't didn't have the full theory set out. Right, and so that's uh, that's a way that. It's often invoked. I think the particle physicists would probably not call it gravity. We don't. Um, we, we never. We never say that word. That's, right. That's that's so, the thing that's locked in the tower and just sort of never discussed. Well, is gravity. So to a particle to, to a particle physicist, they would say there's a new gravitational strength force, and it's probably mediated by some quantum particle. Mm, sure. And that particle has a name, and so and that would be this scalar field thing. Is that's the particle that mediates this repulsive yeah. force. And they wouldn't necessarily call it gravity um, because it's not in the gravity theory. It's not the graviton. Um, now, that's not entirely true because there are some theories where the graviton is actually there. Are, there's a, a scalar, a vector, and a tensor um, particle, and the tensor part gives you gravity, and the scalar part could give you dark energy. So that's Tevis. Um, Tevis, I think, te tensor vector scalar. Yeah. Um, the Tevis theory uh, has, the graviton has these partners that have uh, different spin properties um, and therefore you can get Einstein's gravity with one part of that and then you get a scalar part that mm. would give you the dark energy. Um, and that's kind of a unified gravitational theory. Um, now I, I have to admit that I'm, I'm a little bit rusty on, on these things but as my memory serves me that's the case. But it, so uh, so but there, the, are some, there are some theories of gravity that are quantum theories of gravity that contain a particle that could be the dark energy, but not all of them do. In fact, most of them don't. But the interesting thing about this DAISY study is that because they're going to such um, large distances uh, far back in the evolution of the universe, if you can see that gravity behaves differently as a function of time, maybe that can give us some insights into potentially where the bug in our theory is, if there is one. Um, so I'm going to say yes, but there's a, a big asterisk by it in that what you probe with um, astronomical observations is 
wildly different than what you probe in laboratory experiments. Hmm. So laboratory experiments, you need a quantum theory to, to interpret laboratory experiments. Um, where with dark energy measurements that you make on the sky, and that's the only place that dark energy has been seen is with astronomical measurements. Um, then you're looking at things that are happening over gigantic length scales, um, like intracluster length scales. And so what you can constrain is somewhat limited. Yeah. The parameter space that most of these things are designed to constrain are um, the equation of state of the dark energy. So what that means is as the dark energy changes, um, as the universe changes in size, how does the energy density of the, from dark energy change? Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Um, if, you, if you have a gas of photons and it's at some temperature, if you expand it, if you take those photons and you expand them, the energy density of the photon gas falls as uh, the radius to the fourth power. The reason being is that you have these photons, you spread them out, and so that gives you, so you're spreading out into a larger volume, and that's three factors of R. And then also the photons themselves are stretching, which yeah. means that they're losing energy, and yeah. that's a fourth factor of R. Yeah. And so how the energy density of the dark energy changes as the universe goes through its evolution is uh, what they're looking for. And what they've, they've already measured that it appears as though the equation of state is minus one, meaning that the exponent in some formula is negative one. Um, but what they want to see is if that particular exponent changes with time. Yeah. And so they're looking at the time derivative of the equation of state parameter for dark energy. So it would be nice if that vacuum pressure was much, much earlier in the early universe and then has sort of fallen off as we as we move to the Well, it could fall off, it could grow. Um, dark energy hasn't, um, hasn't really been the major contributor for uh, through most of redshift space. So it's only near redshift zero, um, you know, redshift one, redshift two, mm. where the dark energy has become the dominant force in the universe causing things to expand. Okay. Now that's a lot of time, a lot of physical time, yeah. but in terms of redshift space, um, in terms of the number of decades of time, like the orders of magnitude in yeah. time, yeah. Um, it's a small chunk. Yeah. Like a redshift of two, when you're looking at the... Um, it might not be a lot of interesting time because it's been quite uniform over that. Right. Yeah. So the... Um, uh, like the cosmic microwave background radiation happened at a redshift of 1100. And the Big Bang nucleosynthesis happened at a redshift uh, a lot smaller than that. Yeah. And so um, these, the fact that the last two redshifts correspond to a lot of physical years doesn't mean that they're, you know, yeah. a lot of that has just been quiescent evolution yeah, of yeah, galaxies. Yeah. They say quiescent with like gigantic explosions. Of yeah, no, numbers. sure. But yeah, on, a, on, a, on an average out scale has been quite sort of business as usual if you if you want to put uh, it that way so for for most of the evolution of the universe dark energy has not been um the major component yeah uh, so and therefore if you want to probe its effects you have to have good and highly sensitive um measurements i think that with dark energy with this daisy i don't know what redshift they're going to um but i suspect that it's probably not much farther than uh, like three or something like that. It says it said in the yeah. article, um, there have been similar projects which we've discussed. This is going to cover much more of the sky and measures acceleration of the universe with three times the accuracy. I guess that's measuring all of the values with three times the accuracy. It's not actually going back. It's not. Expanding. It's not going back three times farther. Yeah, it's not uh, expanding how, how far it's going. Most of these measurements you want to make at the time when the transition happens between. Mm -hmm dark matter or matter dominated and energy dominated. Yeah. Um, and so that there is a special point in redshift space where you, I think you have the most leverage. Um, so, uh, and the whole goal is to shrink the uncertainties in the equation of state parameter and its time derivative. Yeah. That's this instrument. That's what it's designed to do. It will do it by measuring the clustering properties of galaxies as a function of redshift. Yep. Yeah. It will have higher quality redshift than the photometric survey does because it can actually measure the redshift directly from the spectrum. Um, and so you, uh, because it has the better measurements of redshift, it can place the galaxy. When it has a map of where the galaxies are located, it can place them better along the line of sight. Yeah. Um, 35, so 30, it, 35 million galaxies. So we're going up uh, another order of magnitude, I guess, on the yeah. on the previous. Uh, so that, 
previous That's survey. Big. What what's the what's the the best result we could we could hope for out of this? Some what's the, the best, best lead be that they could give us to towards the, the, potentially understanding what this dark energy is? The best thing would be to see something weird. Yeah. Um, so the best thing that they would be able to to do would be either to show that the equation of state is not negative one. Um, so if you have a cosmological constant, then the equation of state is negative one. Um, so you either if they show that it's not negative one, so their error bar shrinks down to the point where the measurement is offset from negative one to some number of significant digits, um, or that the time derivative is non-zero. So one of those two things would be that, I mean, that's the kind of information. The, the time derivative of this vacuum zero. energy density. Right. Yeah. Or it's the time derivative of the equation of state parameter. Yeah. So that it might be minus one now, but it may be in the past it was a different number, yeah. minus 1.1 yeah. 1. 1 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so either of those two things would be an enormous breakthrough. Um, of course, no one would believe it the first time around. And so sure. then they would build another experiment to, that would look at a different part of the sky or that would you know, probe it in some other way. Um, what they would probably have to go to a different type of probe. Um, so each, it would still be an astronomical survey uh, to probe it because that's the only way that we can do this. But they would use a different um, property of the universe to infer the dark energy properties. So for example, this one is going to be using... I mean, I'm that's, that's of, good practice, right? Because you have essentially independent verification. So the, the problem, for example, at the LHC, when we found the Higgs, you, uh, Atlas and the CMS experiment are mm -hmm. built on completely different concepts. They have a different, um, a different structure. They have different internal design so that you get that essentially independent verification. The collaborations don't talk to one another regarding the results until they're published. So mm -hmm. it's good to have those different ways of approaching the same problem. So you have some uh, some confidence that you, you've seen the same thing from different angles. Yeah, and the same thing happened at Fermilab. They would have uh, D0 and CMS. Or, uh, wait, CDF. CMS. Is it CDF? CDF. Yeah. D yeah, CDF. CDF. The something detector facility. Um, I forget. So I forget all of my zero. acronyms now. Yeah. We're built around different um, different technologies. Yeah looking at different tracks.